I want uh, you to picture your Thanksgiving table, you know, uh, just this, the iconic Thanksgiving table for your, your family or your community or whoever, you know, you tend towards uh, having Thanksgiving with. Um, what are the items that are usually on it? Uh, I imagine uh, many of us stand over the table for a few moments before we call everyone in to eat. Just double checking, right? What's here, everything we need. And then we usually sit down to eat and uh, begin to dig in and pass dishes around. Um, and, and that's a joyous time. Now here's what happens after that point in my family. Sometime midway through the meal, uh, not right at the start when we've taken our first bites, but, but when we're probably around the time we're, we're evaluating what we want seconds of and how much seconds we want, you know, that, that interim period, right about that time every year that my mother stands up suddenly and says, the cranberry sauce. And then she goes into the pantry to get the can of cranberry sauce and she uh, opens it with a can opener and then puts it out, you know, in the, in the a long can sized um, can shaped uh, form on a fancy blade. <laughs> That's one of our Thanksgiving rituals. One of those things that happens every year. Now it's actually, it's actually a ritual that's not very intentional. Uh, that nobody sets out to do, but somehow growing up every single year, the cranberry sauce um, was remembered and set on the table about midway. Rituals are so important, even those unintended ones. And honestly, that ritual is uh, very dear to my heart, despite the fact that it's not supposed to be a ritual, but for, for us, it is. And, you know, these are the things that shape and form us. Rituals have an important power to help us be who we want and need and, and intend to be. Rituals teach and they form and they direct us and they, they uh, help us uh, in life in a myriad of ways. That's clear in scripture where there are all sorts of rituals, including the one we've, we've heard from today from the book of Deuteronomy. It's an ancient Thanksgiving ritual. Um, and the, the text this morning offers this ritual uh, to take place as, as the harvest begins, right? At the, at, the, at the beginning of the harvest, that the first of the fruits are to be brought in this prescribed way. You would be mistaken if you thought this was a rote action. Even though it's prescribed, even though it's, uh, it's written out and, and has a form and a function, it's intended uh, to bring a fullness and a spirit of thankfulness and, and generosity. In, in this ritual, the Israelites are instructed to rehearse their history, to tell their story again. You know, that history and that story are so important in understanding the, the need and the reason to be thankful. They're asked to remember and shape their, uh, remember and recall and rehearse their story because there's a power in that. And we would, we would do well to remember that, that as they are asked to bring a basket full of the first fruits, as they're asked to declare their intention to, to be thankful and to acknowledge the, the Lord's uh, graciousness to them, as, as they're asked to recall their story and to say, my ancestor was a wandering heir man, you know, you know not, not to forget the long history of God's providence and care for them. And, and, and the fact that they, despite their plenty now, have been a people who were oppressed and, and, and who were marginalized and, and whose lives were pretty sketch, right? To remember all these things um, in the midst of the beginning uh, of the harvest. 
these instructions, these rituals, um, they help direct um, our future by recalling and naming our past. Now this year, you and I are, are gathering around emptier tables, you know, more, more elbow room at our tables for most of us this year. And the rituals that usually uh, guide and direct the, the coming week uh, may not be enacted at all. What, what is Thanksgiving to look like for us this year in the midst of empty chairs um, and, um, and less crowded tables? Um, it, it would be easy to think there's not much to be thankful for. It'd be easy to think our baskets don't have to be very full, not much to put in them this year uh, in the midst of a global pandemic and um, some, some very real threats to democracy and in the midst of uh, an economy that has left many, many, many people struggling and many, many, many people hungry. What, what ritual can we lean into to help us make sense of that and to direct us beyond it? What ritual can speak to us in the midst of anxiety uh, about all that we do indeed have to be grateful for? This might be a really good moment to remember that that first Thanksgiving, which we have so mythologized, uh, uh, in a way that often leads us to forget a key fact. Of the 102 people who first came to Plymouth Plantation, um, almost half died. And there were about 50 still alive for that first Thanksgiving after a really, really awful first winter. About 50. So, you know, the origins of this week uh, are rooted in hardship and rooted in struggle. And, and uh, that ought well remind us that, you know, even in challenging circumstances, gratitude is essential to our existence. It's possible um, and, and it's helpful and, it, and it's meaningful. We can absolutely name all of the challenges we face, and we should, right? We should be honest and truthful about the circumstances we find ourselves in. We shouldn't sugarcoat anything. And gratitude does not require us to sugarcoat anything. Thankfulness does not require us to ignore the very real challenges. Um, um, reality and thankfulness um, struggle and gratitude, pain and sorrow and gratitude, all of these can coexist and should, and should. We need to lay claim to both of those threads this week. Um, because then our gratitude and our thankfulness is really real and sincere and, and, and can truly point us towards um, a realistic and possible outcome um, as we try and create what's next together. One of the things that's important about the story that the Israelites in this ritual are asked to rehearse is their powerlessness. You know, our short-term memory is, is often really bad culturally. Um, and we remember what we want to remember and we ignore what's inconvenient. Um, but the Israelites in their plenty are asked to remember that they were not always powerful people. And in, in laying claim to their history of powerlessness, um, it gives a place to be in a way to be conscious of um, you know, who they've been and who they could be again. And uh, that would be useful to us who are feeling, you know, uh, kind of downtrodden. If, if we were to remember the, the ways in which, um, you know, we've struggled before. And we'll 
probably struggle again. Um, and, and that all of this is just one thread of our story. Um, and, and to rehearse that, to rehearse our previous powerlessness and our potentially future powerlessness, you know, to be conscious uh, of all of the circumstances of our story and our present gives us a direction for our future. I think it can be very strange for those of us who live in this time in, in jobs that are entirely unrelated to harvesting and, and you know, not seasonal. Um, so in the ritual, the, the uh, Israelites are asked to come with a basket, a basket full of fruits. Well, I mean, what would be in your basket if you work the kind of job that, uh, you know, pays you the same uh, every other Friday? That uh, if you work in the kind of job where you don't even see a paycheck, right? You know, I mean, in these days of direct deposit, um, uh, the fruits of our labor are entirely digitized. Um, and how do, you, how do you put that in a basket, right? Um, we are uh, untethered to uh, the awareness that so many previous generations have of a period of fallow time and preparation in the winter, uh, a, a period of readying in the spring and the beginning uh, of, of that season and the hard work of the summer and the fruit that comes from the ground um, in the fall, we are untethered to that. So we may actually uh, forget to put things in our basket, or we, we may well forget even that we need a basket, right? Um, because we are not conscious. We're in, in many ways blind to, uh, to these uh, cycles and these rituals that have brought the ritual of Thanksgiving across cultures like not just ours. Um, I don't mean the ritual of Thanksgiving is practiced in the US. I mean, the rituals of Thanksgiving that every culture has um, in some way or another embraced. So if we're people without a basket, we might well forget how important it is for us to be conscious of the ways we're blessed and the ways we get to be a blessing. Part of the ritual uh, that's prescribed for the Israelites in this text from Deuteronomy this morning is to celebrate. So here's all the things they do, right? They, they, they get a basket and they put the first fruits. They go to the priest and they declare their intention and their thankfulness to God. They rehearse their story. And then when that's all over, the scripture says, and now go and throw a party for you and all your workers and all the aliens in the land and all the people who are um, living uh, you know, close to the bone, all of those people, you're gonna throw them a party and all of y'all are gonna celebrate together. I mean, this is a, a moment right where having a party is a religious act a religious discipline having a party is a religious discipline okay in this context um, to celebrate to to, to to really be joyful uh, uh, about blessings particularly in, in the midst of hardship is, uh, is a faithful way to give thanks to God and inviting those, right? So, so we're blessed to be a blessing, inviting those who are less able to share, to share in your plenty, whatever, whatever that is, um, is part of what it means to be grateful and to be thankful. Think about um, if that ritual ended before the celebrate piece, right? So you can fill your basket, you bring your basket, you um, declare your thanks, you rehearse your story, and then you go home. That just seems really impoverished, potentially. No, but God calls you to have a party to celebrate, to, to, to throw a feast. Uh, and that feast doesn't require 17 kinds of potatoes, 
right? Um, you can have just mashed potatoes this year. And, and when you have filled a basket, declared your thanks, rehearsed your story and gathered to celebrate, that's, that's feast enough. That's feast enough. Doing these things is uh, an opportunity to shape who we are and how we are in the world. Doing these things, engaging in these acts is, is, a, is an opportunity to create the future we want out of the challenges of, of this moment. In acknowledging and remembering, in rehearsing and proclaiming, in feasting and celebrating, even at a table with empty chairs and too much elbow room. Out of these will be born the people we intend to become, creating together the future we want to see for ourselves. It begins by asking yourself and asking each other, what's in your basket? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.